Okay, hello everyone. Uh, it's four minutes past the hour, so let's let's get this started. And for convenience of the people who could join, who couldn't join us at this time, I will be recording the session. Or in case you want to review it, rewatch it again later. So we'll be sending it um, so you can you can watch it with uh, with calm. Hello everyone, my name is Delphine Basalo from Uponor Infra and welcome to this webinar about sustainable solutions for closed aquaculture co-organized between Uponor, Blue Green, Signify and Vister. We have four experts in the room today who will be sharing their, um, their insights about um, making aquaculture more sustainable. And uh, this is the, um, the name of the presenters, the companies that they are representing. We will, go in, we will go through their insights and at the end, we will have some time for questions and answers. So if you have something to ask to the presenter, just write it down, we will have time at the very end. So you can, um, we can take as many questions as, as the time allows us. And uh, having said that, some just housekeeping, um, advice, please keep your microphone muted. You know, you should see it there in at the bottom or in the right hand side where there is um, there is that small microphone icon. And if you have, if you want to make uh, already a question, just write it down in the chat, um, however you want it. So just put it and we will take in, we will take them in the end. And that's it for the, for the housekeeping uh, intro. So to set up the context of this topic, we have uh, Nils Johan Tufte from Blue Green, who will be taking us just a quick int introduction to what is this topic about. Please, Nils Johan. Okay, thank you, Nelson. Uh, we know today that uh, fish farming already is uh, quite sustainable uh, uh, business to be in. Uh, there was recently uh, the pair index was recently telling about the biggest protein producers in the world and three out of the top four are represented by existing fish farming companies uh, but we also know that uh, the world is needing more sustainable proteins in the future uh, norway and other countries have big growth ambitions in producing more salmon we know that there are some challenges to overcome in order to hit national targets. Uh, like Norway, we have a target of uh, five times multiplication by 2050. And in order to do so, we need new technology and uh, sustainable solutions for closed aquaculture. So this group here is representing uh, closed containment systems. We have uh, material suppliers, we have light producers and suppliers. Uh, waste collecting systems and uh, already uh, executed projects. So I'm happy to, to uh, be a part of this group and hope you have uh, some valuable information after today's uh, webinar. Thank you very much. So let's get started. Uh, uh, Michel. Please. Yes. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Michiel van der Meer, uh, working for uh, Signify, um, and I'm going to uh, tell you mostly about our lighting solutions that we use for closed uh, uh, system, closed aquaculture systems. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. So, uh, a short introduction to our company, Signify. I think many of the people know you as. Uh, know us as Philips. Uh, a few years ago, we split off from uh, Royal Philips as a separate uh, lighting company um, and went on, on the stock market uh, as Signify, but we still uh, own the Philips brand for all our lighting systems. Um, we focus on light sources, luminaires, systems and services, and we are everywhere in the world. Uh, but we are also very proud to be the number one uh, in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index in our category. And we are that already for uh, many years in a row. Um, and that is also why we are proud to be part of uh, the agriculture and aquaculture industry with our lighting solutions, because they can really benefit towards uh, more sustainable ways of uh, farming. 
Uh, next slide, please. So, a uh, short introduction to uh, our agriculture business. So, uh, I am part of a bigger family of uh, lighting providers that provide also light for horticulture and for animal lighting. And we are, as our company, active uh, worldwide. Next slide, please. So, in aquaculture, we are now for 10 years active and we started with our marine based aquaculture lighting solutions, then uh, moved into land, mostly on hatcheries. Uh, in the last couple of years, you see a tremendous amount of uh, uh, new alternatives like uh, on land uh, outgrowing installations. But an interesting one that uh, we are talking today about is uh, closed aquaculture systems out there on the sea. And of course, uh, light uh, it plays an enormous role uh, in the development of uh, many creatures. But if you are going to a closed system or move indoors, then light uh, becomes even more important because of the sun being uh, excluded from that uh, farming. Next slide, please. So in the meantime, we have uh, lighting solutions for all the different uh, stages of the life cycle of a fish. So from the egg development, uh, uh, the ongrowing and uh, the broodstock to make the circle uh, round. And next slide. And we've been working very closely uh, with a network of partners where on one side we work with research partners like University of Stirling and Bergen when it uh, comes to salmon. Uh, lighting and also our customers on the other side to come to the best solutions and especially in the combination of the companies we have here today we really work closely together to make this uh, also happen in in uh, closed systems uh, next slide yeah so one of the key things we found out during our uh, journey uh, with the university of sterling was what is the best spectrum of light to develop the salmon and uh, how is it going? How do you actually uh, provide that light to the salmon? And one of the main observations was not only that we need to have a combination of blue and green light, but also that the light actually should uh, not be directed towards the eyes, but towards the pineal gland of the uh, fish, which is in the top of their uh, skull, just uh, top of their head, just under the skin. With an open skull, they have uh, their own photoreceptors uh, directly uh, there. And uh, the things we achieved in the past, we can see on the next slide. So uh, already uh, very early, we uh, did uh, uh, several trials in, uh, in the fish farming where we had more than 10% additional growth achieved by applying light in a proper way. Um, the two of them, uh, one with Leroy and one with that time Marine Harvest, now known as MOI, were, were done and published. And on the next slide, you will see that in the last uh, nine years. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, this was repeated uh, about uh, 22, uh, 23 times uh, with different companies. And on average, we now achieve a growth increase of 12% with a proper lighting, a maturation reduction to close to zero. So this, the minus 2.5 was compared to the control groups and a, a feed conversion uh, improvement of uh, close to 10%, 9 9.2 on average. And this was achieved uh, both uh, on uh, outdoor cages and on inland uh, situation. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, looking into closed aquaculture system, it becomes much more relevant how to apply the light properly there. So next slide, please. So it is all about uh, when do you apply it, how much do you apply it, in which uh, direction do you apply it, and what is the color of the light that you apply. So we have established already um, the, the proper spectrum and the proper light treatment uh, uh, scheme over the year. We know what the direction is, and now it is back to engineering to make it work in a, in a closed system. So next slide, please. Yeah, so what we are going to need in this case is uh, our underwater luminaires because uh, we we do also have overwater luminaires, but those are not very helpful in a closed system where 
uh, where the water is everywhere. So we either use our 680 watt or our 340 watt marine uh, based uh, uh, underwater uh, luminaires. Uh, next slide. So if you look uh, from above on a tank or a cage, then you can easily make a light calculation uh, based on the light distribution on the surface. And that's uh, actually where we are already quite good at. Um, but in the last couple of years, uh, it became more and more uh, apparent that actually what happens on the surface is not that uh, relevant uh, anymore. It's really much more important what happens below the surface because um, if the water quality or the amount of fish is that high, that uh, amount of light actually uh, 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 goes down quite uh, fast with depth, then you have to really make sure that you apply light in all the proper uh, positions uh, of the system. So uh, we are uh, working on developing um, how light is actually um, uh, traveling through the entire water column of the water system. So if you go to the next slide. So we made calculations based on uh, turbidity and transmission models where we look at, okay, if you have a very uh, a good water quality system or you have a very uh, a bad water quality system, how far does the light penetrate through the water? And uh, we also did a lot of measurement in different systems and typically you have uh, about uh, four to five meter in, in on land systems where, where you can um, uh, still have enough light at the uh, bottom of the tank. And for a closed system, you, all, you have to really think about where uh, do you place your lights and how deep does it uh, need to travel. Um, and this, you can see that there's a huge uh, difference in the amount of light uh, far away from the land, depend if you have good or worst water quality. And with that, uh, it is good that we now have a cooperation with people who do the the, the waste uh, uh, treatment and uh, the filtration of the light to keep the turbidity very low and the transmission very high. So if you go to the next slide. So a few ways to get there is to make sure that you have in different locations of this tank, you have a light. So you throughout the, the depth of your tank, you can uh, make sure that you stay above the minimum threshold level of light to prevent the maturation and to have the light at a minimum level to get the biological effect in, uh, in those fish. So, uh, and based on that model, we started to do an initial uh, uh, light um, set up for, uh, for the closed system that uh, is being developed uh, uh, together with the companies. And we can uh, have a, we can show that in the next slide. So it started with uh, the creation of this uh, donut uh, uh, shape where uh, we had a, uh, a, a very big, uh, uh, yeah, a, a large amount of water to cover. So uh, doing uh, light calculations and transmission calculations, we came up with an initial plan to have at 12 different locations, actually uh, just below the surface hatch, uh, a set of two different uh, uh, luminaires, 340 watt luminaires, uh, pointing downwards to make sure that we have light uh, everywhere where the fish are swimming. And if you, uh, on the next slide, you will see a uh, cross section so the lights are now not uh, downward facing, but also uh, to make sure that the light is in the upper part, we uh, put them under an angle under the surface uh, hatch and uh, make sure that the light is uh, uh, directed uh, downwards enough and in the horizontal plane to make sure that we cover uh, the entire uh, volume of the, of the donut. So um, I think this is, was my uh, last slide. And I uh, would like to hand it over to the next uh, speaker. Thank you very much, Michelle. Yeah, next we have Kari Karjalainen from Upono Infra. Kari. Yes, thank you. So my name is Kari Karjalainen. I come from Upono and from the Infra side and uh, from the Project Services Division, who has been a, a supplier of, of, of special projects and turnkey 
uh, projects to our customers all the way from the 1950s when we started the plastic uh, production. Next slide. <clears throat> and uh, we are one of the largest uh, polyethylene manufacturers in, in north of Europe and we have also factories all around the world and also licensee factories all around the world which you can see on the on the numbers as well. Next slide. Uh, here I just uh, took a slide to show uh, different kind of, of systems and solutions that we provide and I put in the bold bold color on the on the right hand side I put the products which is um, of interest for the for the aquaculture and the fish farming land based or sea based just to show to uh, as, as a list for you later on to, to see which systems we can provide next slide <clears throat> the coming three blue slides is also just for you guys to to download the presentations to to, to remember a little bit what we can provide but but just shortly, we are not just providing pipes or, or, or pipe products. Uh, we on project services here on, on, on Uponor Infra, we are a partner for you, which I will show in the two, two um, uh, pilot projects also in the, in the end here. And we can do everything from from the, the engineering, the project management, the site management, and, and be uh, the one-stop shop for, for you as a, as a customer on, on the poly, polyethylene side of, of the projects. Next slide. So here you will just see the same things what, what I just explained. Next slide. And a little bit of the sizes of the, the products which, which we have. So up to 3.5 meters in, in inside diameter for the, for the pipes. And then, of course, we have panels which have started to be an important part of our of, of, of product in our joint uh, product, products with the fish farms nowadays. Next slide. So here, the first uh, uh, customer project which we want to show today is the Anfjord Salmon uh, Farm up in the north of Norway. And here in this project, we have been the partner for, for Anfjord, both in the detailed design and engineering all the way from the beginning of the project. We have supplied the pipes fittings. Uh, we supply the, the, the full site works with the welding. Uh, we also supply as a turnkey contract the full marine works with all the marine uh, works on the bottom of the seafloor and also uh, then uh, sinking the, the intakes and outfalls. So here you see that we have our own railroad with us. Typically we have three railroads next to each other. Here we have only one because it's a small project. Uh, here you see one of, of the three uh, marine strings for the 450 meter long uh, marine intake for the zero basin of the Anfjord Salmon uh, farm. Uh, next slide. And here you see when we take the first uh, marine string into the intake chamber where the pumps are. So this is uh, this is the, the, the one third of the intake string which uh, which we will place on the bottom of the ocean floor. And this has an inside diameter of 2.2 meters. So it's a fairly small pipe uh, in, in, in our projects. And it, that's because this is for the first zero basin. Uh, later on, there will be much, much larger pipes uh, when the next basins will come. Next slide. Uh, we will also, of course, provide the land, land-based uh, uh, pipes. Uh, so on the right hand side, you will see the distribution pipes to the zero basin uh, uh, as well. So all, all the land-based pipings, of course, we will also provide 
and Andrew as a turnkey undertaking. Next slide. Here you will also see on the left hand side, you see the, the intake uh, screen, which will be positioned uh, almost half a kilometer out on the, on the seabed. Uh, to filter uh, the, the water into the to the salmon uh, basins. So these these we always uh, supply as well, and uh, you can barely see one of our fitters below it. So this is uh, six seven meters high. It's still a fairly small intake structure compared to the to the big projects. So. Uh, these type of, of uh, intake structures and, and, and diffuser, diffuser systems on the outfalls, we also provide naturally and the design and engineering for them as well. Next slide. Uh, then we can shift to the fish globe project that of course many of you know and uh, this is the first uh, fish globe project which we finished in 2019, built in, in uh, uh, together with RPD at that time, which is now then Blue Green Fusion, which we work with. And uh, this was the first of the 3.5k uh, fish globes, which, which uh, Fish Globe uh, has built together with us. In this case, also, we have been the engineering partner from the beginning of the project. Uh, we are the main contractor for the whole project. We, are the pro we have the project management the site management and the, the total customer in, interface on the whole uh, polyethylene side. Then, of course, uh, there are a lot of electrical equipment and, and other things which, which we are not responsible for. So, uh, on the right hand side, you see when the total globe is lifted to sea, and on the left hand side, you see the first panel buildings uh, and, and the center pipe. Uh, being taken into the construction building at the, at the start. Next slide. Uh, here you see the, the second uh, of the 3.5k fish globes, uh, which we uh, launched uh, in the sea just a few months back. And, and now the fish, fish is getting uh, already got, got into to that a uh, few days ago. So the first globe has the fifth uh, cycle of fish in it, and the second globe now have the first uh, first fish in it, and uh, the uh, it shows that the fishes uh, are in very very good condition in in this closed environment. Next slide. Here you see a little bit from the construction phase from the inside of the second globe. So this is a three thousand five hundred cubic meter fish water volume and uh, with uh, co-extruded white uh, polyethylene on the, on the black panels to, to help with the light conditions and, and reflecting of the lights, which we heard in the first presentation. So this, this is made for a quarter of a million salmons, uh, uh, these 3.5 cases, as you know from fish clocks presentations earlier. Uh, next slide. So these uh, 3.5k globes, which we have then built from from uh, from zero to, to to full globes, with which we have also developed these panels for here in Vasa in Finland. So these are then uh, 22 meters in diameter, 20 meters high, weighs 200 tons. The the basic globe itself, and there are of course. Uh, larger ones uh, on its way, 10K and, and 30K, which we have already started the engineering works on. So anything which, which you can uh, kind of uh, need or, or dream, we, we, we can kind of build for you. So there's no, no limits anymore. And, and these are already world records for uh, polyethylene constructions in, in marine conditions. Next slide. Here you can see a little bit of, of the building process of the lower uh, megastructure. Next slide. Here you see a little bit of the construction process of the top structure. Next slide. 
and then the, the managing process uh, for the fish lower fish volume and the upper technical structures. So that was just a short presentation of the capabilities of uh, Uponor Infra Project Services. Uh, so thank you, and I'm looking forward for the questions later on. Thank you very much, Kari. Next up, we have uh, Nils Johan Tufte from Blue Green. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Wilfield. Next slide, please. Very quick introduction. I uh, have my master's degree in civil engineering from 2002, and I used to work with steel and concrete materials initially. Uh, since then, I have been working 15 years with thermoplastics and in blue green the latest two years also with thermoplastics. So uh, from different uh, perspectives of material, uh, I would say that uh, thermoplastic, especially polyethylene, has really good uh, capabilities and properties when it comes to fish farming. We know today that it is the main uh, part of existing cages, the floating ring. And we know that it's really good with the non corrosiveness and uh, you can weld it. And we also know that it's possible to re recycle it. Uh, you can grind it and melt it and reuse it. And this material is also um, qualified for a drinking water material. So uh, it, it's really a good material uh, to keep working with. The blue green companies have different uh, interest in this. I'm focusing today more on the construction part and the technologies part. So next slide, please. Uh, the company uh, have 30 employees and uh, we do everything around uh, engineering, procurement, construction and installation. Next slide, please. So uh, coming from a plastic pipe welding company, uh, we realized from this project that polyethylene can also be used as a structure material, not only fluid transportation. This was a windmill structure and it's exposed to a lot of the same impacts that uh, uh, closed containment systems will be. Next slide, please. So that took us in the direction of uh, some years ago, we produced free life a closed fish farming post smolt facility for preline, uh, now owned by Lero Seafood. In the middle, we were a part of uh, the fish globe number one on behalf of Yuponor as a subcontractor. And to the right, uh, we were happy to work with Yuponor as a subcontractor also for the second uh, fish globe just launched, as you could hear from Yuponor. Next slide, please. So uh, we want to drive the innovation on and keep being better all the time. We know that we are facing a lot of different uh, products in market, some in fiberglass, some in steel. Uh, and uh, what we really think is that when we have a design trees, something that really makes sense, we can scale it up. The main cost of a thermoplastic structure is actually the labor hours. So since this is a material that we can fuse together, it's also offering some amazing opportunities around optimization. We can invest in uh, smart tools that can put this together and melt it together in record time. Um, that's also why I believe it's a preferred choice of material for the future. Next slide, please. So uh, there are a lot of uh, innovation going on these days in Norway. Uh, some years ago, we had this uh, development license uh, race. It, uh, it's a lot of new ideas, uh, some closed, some open, some offshore, but everything is initiated in order to meet the government's target of five times uh, volume increase by 2050. So we think maybe that could be hard, maybe three times is possible. Still, it's a lot of cages. So we have today 4,000 net fans in Norway. And if you multiply that, apply that with three or five, it's a tremendous number and the market is big. Uh, they will need a lot of different products. Uh, as a response to, to this, the government is now issuing a new licensing system 
and probably in place next year, environmental technology system uh, that will deal more with the sea lice issues, waste collection, and also escape group systems. Next slide, please. So uh, we were thinking, how can we uh, contribute to this uh, market demand? We uh, we uh, have uh, designed a donut shape that we have tested in a pool. Uh, next, please. And the main uh, concept overview of the marine donut is that it's uh, representing all the advantages from thermoplastic materials that I just uh, talked briefly about. We also have designed it to resist uh, uh, big impacts like where the most fish farming is done today. Uh, closed systems will also uh, give new opportunities for digitalization and monitoring and control. We have a water exchange rate in less than an hour. Uh, it's offering new smart logistics. And we know that the currents uh, are uh, exercising the fish, giving premium quality. We do have the opportunity with the polyethylene to, to get whatever color uh, the fish would prefer. So we expect a light gray color to be good for the fish welfare and also the reflection of the light. We're working together with the uh, Signify to, to design the optimized uh, light conditions for the fish. And uh, this structure is currently designed for a significant wave height of three meters and the speed of currents one and a half meters per second. The test in the pool was very successful. We also have provided for waste collection that I will touch more in the following slides. Next slide, please. So uh, there has been a lot of focus on the CAPEX. Uh, we do know that closed systems uh, run in a controlled way have really good advantages looking at the OPEX. So my focus is how can we produce more healthy, sustainable fish at a cheaper cost per kilogram? Not necessarily the capex. We know that uh, the history is saying something about what it costs today, and we want to challenge and try to beat it over time. Next slide, please. The overall dimension, so the marine donut is 60 meter. Uh, the depth is 20 meter, and you can draw in water from 15 to 40 meters. Next slide, please. So we work with Signify on the lights. This is a little older. Uh, uh, illustration, uh, but it it shows that we can use the lightning as uh, as Michael was uh, talking about uh, in top, and it will cover all the depth down to the depth of the donut. We're very happy and uh, optimistic that this will give a supreme uh, uh, environment for the fish. I do see that I have a little mistyping there. It's 340 watts. But uh, we are very hopeful that this will be a good environment for the fish. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the donut is 22,000 cubic meter. It can hold uh, 1 million posts, all for 200,000 market fish. On the top, we have uh, food distribution and also solar cell panels to add the electricity capacity in addition to a short power cable. Next slide, please. This is just showing the how it's looking inside. Next slide, please. And this is showing the root of the water, how it's uh, sucked in, in uh, through six water intakes. Uh, we have developed now an intake system with UV filtration. It's passing through a Bernoulli filter, uh, through the UV filter, uh, and then it's flushed in on the side. Uh, inside, it's uh, going in uh, current speed, and uh, we collect the sediments in the bottom through six places, transfer it to a circumferential pipeline in the top for further treatment. Then we can pump it and dry it, and uh, waster can take care of it and drying it. Next slide, please. So this is showing more on the inside. Uh, six uh, outlets going into the center pipe with uh, water and all the particles is collected at the bottom. Uh, it's adjustable speed of currents up to 80 centimeter per second. 
and this is regulated uh, via uh, two times two propeller pumps. Next slide, please. We are working with ABB for monitoring and control. Um, it's a good system to, to see how the fish is eating and um, all the sensors that are put throughout the system. It can be all connected through good uh, trend analysis and an overview. And you have control of the, all the necessary parameters. Next slide, please. And this is just showing how you can service and maintenance this donut. Uh, we do believe that we should avoid commercial divers as much as possible, both from a cost perspective, but also from a health and safety perspective. So everything is done uh, so you can operate all that from the top surface. Next slide, please. And this is just showing details of the intake chamber. Next slide, please. And this is showing how you can lift and sink the donut by pumps and compressor. You have different volumes that can compress air, remove water, fill water, and this you can submerge and, uh, and lift and fill the donut. Next slide, please. So this is just showing how you can gently transfer the fish to a well boat by pumping air and uh, water control and lift everything to the surface. Next. Please. This is just showing the different uh, production strategies that can also help uh, make it uh, financially reasonable. Everything from small to big fish in different combination, also with existing uh, cage technology. Next slide, please. Yeah, so if you are interested in discussing thermoplastic solutions in aquaculture, please visit our website and, and contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nils Johan. Uh, last but not least, we have Holsten Basset from Weister. Please. Yes, thank you very much. And a lot of things have been said already um, regarding the good solutions for the closed aquaculture. So I will just focus on uh, what's coming out of the process as uh, side streams. Um, and of course, when you make um, closed containment systems, it's much easier to collect the sludge from the uh, aquaculture site. Next, please. Uh, here you can see what we do in waste regarding these side streams. We have small compact machines uh, that can transform the sludge and the mortalities into dried products that can be used in the circular economy. Of course, as a fish farmer, you would like to have the nice fillet on the right side, but uh, inevitably you have some mortalities during the breeding cycle. And also you will have sludge from feces and excess feed. Uh, solutions, uh, typically the smallest one is uh, ideal for uh, processing or mortalities and the larger ones from 40 and upwards is typically used for sludge. Next, please. So this is uh, the two processes. On the right side, at the top, you will see the end product, the dried um, product from um, the sludge, which becomes a biofertilizer product. Uh, it's rich in nitrogen and phosphorus and can be used in agriculture for growing crops like uh, barley or other crops. And you see on the bottom part, uh, you have the mortalities. This is more um, different to valorize for new use since uh, the regulations on the the mortalities disposal is very much strict uh, in the EU and, and Norway. Um, but the best use we see currently is uh, for the dried product to become a biogas substrate, biogas booster, which can actually um, be put into the biogas process directly into the digestion chamber, regulating their process. Next, please. 
Yeah, so on the right side, you see one of our installations where you have a small buffer tank uh, collecting the dewatered sludge. In this case, it is about 20% dry matter. And then uh, the end product from us is uh, above 90% dry matter. So it's a stable product that can be transported and stored uh, in a very safe way in big bags. And the machine, as you can see, is quite compact. Uh, this is from a hatchery, a small hatchery, uh, with a good production capacity. So uh, for some of the larger uh, small uh, hatcheries, you might need more than one machine in parallel, but for most of them, you will only need one machine. Okay, next. So this is the small compact unit that we use for the mortalities. Uh, you see the measures here, it's about 2.4 meters long, uh, only one meter wide and two meters high. And this has been in operation now since January in Croatia at the trout farm with the trout up to 4.5 kilograms. Uh, and they collect all the uh, mortalities from the fish farm. Uh, and process it with this machine. And also they um, uh, add the uh, byproducts from slaughtering the fish uh, because they take out some fish every week. And then the um, byproducts from the processing of the fish also goes into the same machine. Uh, they are very happy about the performance of the machine and, and it works very well on the product. However, if you process trout or salmon, which are very fat fishes, you would need an additive in the process. And this additive is either uh, wood chips or uh, dried spent grain from a brewery, uh, which is a different segment we're working at. So we can provide that product if it's necessary. Uh, for fish with less fat, it's possible to just dry it without any additives. And this is an alternative to the ensilage process, which is currently uh, widely used in Norway and in some other parts uh, of the world. Uh, the formic acid that you use when you're using the ensilage is a hazardous material and uh, you have a number of incidents and uh, injuries among people working with the ensilage every year. So this eliminates all these hazards. And at the same time, it's a very good solution in terms of economy. It's typically a payback time of two to four years for most sites. Next. So these are two different sites with the uh, sludge drying. Um, just to give you an illustration. I think you can go to the next one. Yeah, this is about the use of the dried product as a biofertilizer. We participated in a growth study by Nibio, um, concluding that the yield of the growth on barley was even better than the mineral fertilizer with the same nitrogen level. Um, this might be explained that uh, the dried fish sludge we produce is uh, releasing the nutrients over the whole growth cycle, while some of the other fertilizers uh, are having a boost effect in the beginning and then uh, less effect in their growth later. Next, please. Yes, uh, this is uh, regarding the uh, use of the product as a biofertilizer. In Norway, we have a system with quality classes for biofertilizers in the regulations. And as you can see here, the uh, content of heavy metals is what's determining what kind of quality class it is. And this is a quality class one fertilizer allowing up to 4,000 kilograms of use every 10 year period per acre, which is quite, um, generous. So this is a safe and good biofertilizer product that can be used. However, it's quite low in potassium, the K component. So uh, for a, a complete um, fertilizing, you would probably use two different fertilizers in your field. This one, rich in NNP, 
and another one which is rich in K, or you can mix two together. Next. Yeah, this is uh, the setup uh, and a typical um, performance of the machine when it's working. Um, each of these uh, curves uh, shows a drying cycle, uh, starting with uh, feeding small portions of wet sludge into a base or dried product inside the machine and ends with finalizing the drying and discharging into the big bag. Okay, next one. This is a cross section where you see the machine. Two main principles is uh, mechanical fluidization inside the drying chamber, which makes the product hover inside that volume and with a large particle surface to interact with the drying media. And the other is uh, using superheated steam as drying media. And this superheated steam is created by the moisture from the product coming out uh, to the condenser. We condense some of the vapor and then the rest is reheated to become superheated steam for the next cycle. So it's a closed loop system and it just um, uh, removes the moisture uh, necessary from the product and the rest is used for the next drying um, circle inside the machine. Okay, next. This is a uh, principal sketch of the system. Uh, we can do different solutions for the power consumption. And um, if you don't uh, use any reuse of the uh, heat energy or do any uh, special uh, improvements, then you have 0 0.85 kilowatt hours per kilogram of water removed. If you can reuse the heat energy or if you add the heat pump solution to the dryer, then you can be as low as 0 0.35 kilowatt hours per kilogram of water removal. But basically, the better you have a mechanical dewatering before you start thermal drying, the better. So then you can have a very small, compact and cost efficient machine for the end stage of the processing. Next. Okay, that was my presentation. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Halstein. Now we have a few minutes uh, still left for some questions. I got a couple of questions via the, the PM, the, the private message, and uh, I just reposted them in the chat, but I'm going to read them again. One of them is uh, why using why use plastic to build this type of structures or containers uh, compared to any other material why not use any other material um, who wants to take this one from their presenters yeah maybe i can take the first section of, of the answer of course uh, we as a, a, a plastic producer always talk about the good good uh, things about the plastic and and uh, if you look especially on the marine conditions and you compare the other solutions to plastics uh, plastic you don't need to, to to paint or have any corrosion protection on you will not have any micro cracks uh, in the plastic uh, it's dy dynamically very good for for the dynamic conditions of, of the sea. It will take bending and squeezing and, and, and deforming in a good way and return to its original stage. And then, of course, it's totally uh, recyclable and very green. So we can, after 50 or 100 years, we can regranulate it and, and make new products from it. So that's the short uh, answer from our side. Thank you. Maybe I can fill in a little bit from uh, blue green from a construction point of view. Uh, we know that the density of polyethylene is about 950 kilogram per cubic, less than water. We know that steel has uh, about 7850 and uh, fiberglass maybe 1800. So uh, when you are going to lift segments, elements, you need heavier crates. With plastic, you can go away with lighter equipment. And also, I would say the welding is 
amazing. Uh, like concrete and fiberglass, you have a, a hardening hardening uh, process that you need to wait for it to harden. Uh, the cooling time in thermoplastic is a lot different. So I, I just wanted to add those two things. Thank you very much. Any more comments? Regarding the use of plastic, there was there was another one. I I'm sensing that is more like going towards the environmental side of the yeah the ecological side. That it was mentioned some of Norway's new regulations. So how do you see um, the panel? How do you see the upcoming any upcoming legal landscape? Anything special to pay attention to? Uh, perhaps is well stricter environmental requirements legal framework who wants to give a comment i could start yeah. from blue green uh we we do have a traffic light system today red green and yellow and uh, those are zones that are uh, looking at the impact on the wild salmon uh, from sea lice so we know that the closed containment system they avoid the sea lice uh, big challenges um, that means that we can also start to use new areas that today might be closed if you can provide a technology that avoids these problems. And uh, we know that uh, we just have a new government and they are very focused on uh, uh, waste collection and sludge collection. Uh, we also know that the, the existing business will still be there, of course, it's an important part of the Norwegian uh, coastline. Uh, and uh, we know that there are uh, licensing, uh, offshore licenses developing, and offshore cages, they will need a lot of post smoke. So in order to have a sustainable growth, we believe that there are a combination of all these existing technologies. There is not one against the others. It's a combination of all, all good technologies putting together. Uh, and I didn't hear the question uh, fully, but but uh, you said new regulations and plastic. Is it a good material? Yes. If, for example, if you see the the, the problems in the in the seas, the world oceans uh, with the microplastics, the products which we are now talking about is not. Uh, 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 giving out or 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 having any any of these types of microplastics issues, uh, so we are not letting out any plastics from these systems out in the sea, neither into the fish also. So maybe that's addition to the question there. <clears throat> Thank you very much. We have one more one more question that I got. Uh, how are the fish or the fishes taken out of the containers for harvesting quote unquote uh, are they sucked out um with with water uh, if we start with uh, the the floating or semi floating systems it's more or less the same as with with the old uh, old cages and the existing cages but uh, but in different Systems here we utilize pressurized air then to to lift the systems out from the from the ocean and and without pumps the fishes are transferred into the into the vessels. This is known by by all the, the fish farm industry. So so for the listeners and for the, the the people listening to this, this is already very much known fact. All right, one more, one more actually specifically uh, to Michel. Is the light changed over the lifetime of, of a fish? For instance, the number of hours of lighting the spec, the lighting the spectrum, I don't know if I'm wrong. And can this be used to artificially increase the yield? Yes, um, so the, the light spectrum is actually constant uh, over the lifetime uh, of a fish, only in the extremely first stages uh, of uh, the fish life, uh, just after hatching of the eggs, they have some sensitivity to uh, the red part of the spectrum and they lose that uh, quite soon in their life. So when they are in their fry and par stage, 
uh, moving on, they, uh, they, they require the spectrum that we provide to them. We do that over the entire uh, lifetime. And then the, about the photo period, uh, during the smoltification uh, part, there is a uh, window where they are using a 12, uh, 12 cycle to induce the smoltification uh, part. But once they are going into the grow out phase, uh, most of the farming is done with 24 hour uh, light uh, providing. The only thing that we normally do is we give them a, a quite a, a long period to adapt to the light, because if you change the light uh, very fast, you can induce uh, stress in the fish. So it's uh, actually good to in the first week to very slowly make them uh, get used to the light. And we can do that with our uh, uh, control system. But uh, this indeed, so providing the 24 hour light is actually uh, one of the key parameters um, of how we uh, increase the yield as I showed in my uh, presentation. Um, and that is basically the biology behind it is that the, the appetite increases uh, with the day length because in the fish biology mind, uh, the long day length is uh, uh, related to summertime and in summertime, uh, the appetite usually is much bigger than in the somewhat uh, more hibernation uh, mode they are in the winter. All right, thank you very much. And uh, we are Hello. at the top of the hour is, is what we have, uh, the time that we have at for now, for today. Anyway, in the screen, you can see the email, the contact email for our experts. If you have further questions or if, well, you want to already jump into talking about business, please, please reach out to them. And the, this recording, as long as, as well as the slides, we will be sharing them hopefully tomorrow. And the last thing, thank you very much for your time and your participation.